God is so good. And I'm thankful for Brother Louie preached my sermon this morning in Sabbath school. I, uh, I read my Sabbath school lesson last week, uh, Sabbath. And then uh, I went to church uh, for something. And uh, I laid my Bible and Sabbath school book down. And all I picked up was my Bible. I don't have a Sabbath school lesson anymore. I'm hoping it'll be there at church when I get back by this week. It's good to be here. It's good to be in this house of worship. You know, last time I was with you, I was sharing. And you know, it's, it's good sometimes to hear that somebody heard something you said. You know, Paul talked about the foolishness of preaching. And sometimes I really understand what he means by the foolishness of preaching. It is not a very good way of getting people to do something, to preach to them. There is very little transformation that takes place from the sermons shared from the pulpit. Very little. Now some of you got a church bulletin today. And some of the information in the church bulletin is correct. And there's information in there that before the week's over, somebody will be asking, why didn't anybody tell me about this? And guess where it is? It's in the bulletin. So I'm, I'm inviting you to read your bulletins and, and look at the information that's given there and encourage us as a church to communicate important information through the bulletin. Now, last time I was with you and what I was saying, uh, when I came in this morning, I, I was greeting for a few minutes there, and one of the young ladies came through, sitting back there with Brother Joe Valenti, and she said, boy, we've been finding lots of tobacco hornworms on our tomatoes. And she said, every time I find one, I remember the children's story you share with us. All right? And I wonder if she remembered the scripture and that she can pray the Lord to rebuke the devourer as I'm having to do because I too have found a number of tobacco hornworms this year on my tomatoes. And, uh, and one of those big fat worms can devour a whole tomato plant in just a, a matter of a few hours. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, yesterday I was out in the garden again for just a few minutes and I found my first cantaloupe and, and I gave it to somebody that I felt was in need because you know you can't eat the first fruits, right? So I gave away that cantaloupe. I was gonna bring it to potluck. My wife said, ah, those people got gardens. Give it to someone who needs, who doesn't, not able to, to, to uh, have a garden. And so I did. Anyway, I was out there and I looked at those tomatoes and they looked fine. And this morning, I, I, on my walk, I went by the garden, and oh my, there was 12 of those things in there just eating my tomatoes up. And so my neighbor could have seen me gardening this morning. <laughs> because I had to rebuke the devourer. Last time I was with you, anybody know what we talked about last time I was with you? One of our fundamental beliefs... We talked about, pardon? Well, we talked about the Godhead. We talked about the Trinity. I mentioned God the Father. Today, I'm going to talk to you some more about God. God the Father. Now, who is God? Who is God? What do you say? Go ahead and speak it out. Our creator, somebody said. Can't hear you. A redeemer. The everlasting. Alpha and Omega. Our provider. The I am, somebody says. All right? Bow your heads with me as we open God's word this morning. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege of coming before you to worship. Thank you for your word that has power for our lives, that tells us who you are and who we are in that relationship. Blessed today that we might be moved by your spirit, that we might go from this place nearer to you and about your business. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we talked in Sabbath school, and I'm just going to briefly hit on a few of these things. We talked in Sabbath school about uh, God. We talked about God, the creator. He's the source of all life, the sustainer, the sovereign of all creation, right? That's what our fundamental belief in a nutshell says. He is just and holy and merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and the Holy Spirit are also those of the Father. Right? Jesus said in four, uh, John 14 and verse 9, What, Philip? What, what is the matter with you? Right? Because Philip asked him, we would love to see the Father. Introduce us to the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you? And you haven't even seen me. If you have seen me, you've seen what? The Father. All right? He had told them, I and the Father are what? One. All right. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, if you and I were doing this, if we were writing this book, we would spend a long time introduction trying to explain who God is and where he came from and all this kind of stuff. God started his book with what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right? And, and I'm telling you, in a lot of sense, that should be sufficient for us. That ought to answer a lot of questions for us. If we look at the evidence that God has given us, Apostle Paul said uh, in Romans there, that if you're a pagan, you're a heathen, and you just look out here at the creation God has given, you can see God in his creation. All right? Now, I know that there are any number of folks who might be able to do a better job of what I'm trying to do here today. But I know something else. There is the Holy Spirit in this room. And if you allow the Spirit to speak to you, you're going to get something out of what is shared here today. Life-changing stuff for us. I said for us. Now, Ellen White said there's a way to make your children infidels. If you read in Christ's object lessons, she's talking about the, the sower and, and the seed falling on the good ground and in the brambles and on the rocky places and so forth. And in that chapter, she talks about it. She says there's a way to make your children infidels. Now, you're wondering what in the world does this have to do with a sermon about God? But I think it's very vital that, that we get this connection. Anybody know how you make your children infidels? Nobody. All right, somebody here going to take it, take it. Well, just taking a guess, I would say, by teaching them one thing and doing something else. Well, that's, that's, that's a good part of it. Okay. She says, when we hear a sermon 
and we criticize the message, the messenger, the delivery, whatever, when we criticize the members of our fellowship before our children, we often make comments that are less than complimentary about one another. And she said, when we do those things, we are making our children infidels, all right? And yes, it's by doing differently than what we teach, right? So I'm, I'm just throwing that out there because I want us to think about this in the context. We could tell any one of us probably what we believe about God. We could recite, and we did just a moment ago. You know, I asked you the question and you started telling me all the things that we know about God. You know, he's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? And we can quote and say all that stuff. He's eternal. And we can look at some of these things. I'm going to hit you with a few texts uh, today. And, uh, but, but I want us to think about God. And you know something I didn't hear that ought to be the first thing I think out of our mouth when we say something about God. When Jesus opened the prayer and he said to his disciples, I want you to pray like this. He said, our Father, which art in heaven. It ought to be when I talk about God, I'm talking about my God. All right? Now, I had an interesting experience in Lou's telling a little bit about, about his and about his physician and so forth. But I went in for heart surgery to have bypass surgery a couple years ago. And I talked to the cardiologist and I said, I want to ask you a question. I said, uh, you know, I'll decide if you're going to be my cardiologist. Can I pray with you? He said, well, if that will make you feel better. Well, I took that as a yes, and I prayed with him. I said to the surgeon, can I pray with you? I'd like to pray with you and your team before you go in to surgery. And you know, he said, yes, that, that would be good. I need that. And I prayed with that surgeon. I said to the anesthesiologist, I would like to pray with you and your assistant before we go into surgery. His mouth kind of dropped open and he said, okay. And you know, I didn't know at the moment what all difference that made. But one of the young nurses came to me a couple of days later after I was out of ICU and I'm in the room and the, and the day before I left the hospital. She said, I just wanted to come and see you one more time. She said, I want to tell you, that was awesome. She said, we talked about it. We've had a lot of people pray for patients. We've never had a patient pray for us. And as I prayed that God would give wisdom and skill and that he would guide them, you know what came to me? A peace like you wouldn't believe. I had no frets, no worries, no concern going into this. I don't even remember thinking about it hardly. But you know what they talked about in the, in the operating room? They weren't talking about the sports that was going on. They weren't talking about what they were going to do after work and whatever else and, and about their children and grandchildren. You know, they were talking about during surgery, and this is what she told me. She said, that was a whole different experience. She said, we talked about that. The anesthesiologist, the cardiologist, the, the nurses, they were talking about that this patient prayed for them. And as that surgeon is working, he's thinking, you know, he prayed that I might have skill and wisdom and be able to, that, that things would go well here. And they said, that surgery went so smooth. And when I came out of the surgery and I'm in recovery, he said to my wife, 
This is not my patient. My patients don't look like this when they come out of surgery. And I praise God. Amen. You know that, that I, I was not all puffy and blue and, and, and uh, you know, I'm just, I don't know how many of you have seen somebody just woke up from heart surgery, but they look pretty grotesque, right? I visited a number of them. It wasn't like that. My color was good. I didn't have the swelling. I don't know all that God did, but I know he did something to make an impression on the, on the surgical team. Amen. Who did that? God did that. When we talk about God, we ought to be talking about our God. You, you read some of the Psalms, and the psalmist talks about my God, right? When we talk about the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, all that stuff that God is, it's of little importance unless he's our God, personally. In Deuteronomy, there's a lot said about God. In Deuteronomy, I'm going to turn with, uh, turn with me to chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. You know, throughout uh, the experience of Moses and dealing with the children of Israel, he keeps trying to get them to focus on who God is and what God's doing in their lives and what God has planned for them. And what do they keep thinking about? We're hungry. We're thirsty. Uh, the water doesn't taste good. Uh, we're going to run out of food. Does that sound like anybody we know? You know, what are we going to do in retirement? Is the money going to last? Does my insurance cover, you know, as we're going for, for a surgery? What, what's, what's the insurance going to cover? What's it going to cost me? And we're worried about all these things. And Jesus, in one of his sermons, he said, Hey, I want you to consider the lilies of the field. How they toil not, neither did they spin, but Solomon, in all of his glory, he couldn't buy clothes like that, right? With all the riches that he had. And Jesus is trying to raise our focus from the things of life, the things of every day, the mundane things that we have to deal with to know that we can live to the glory of God and that we can trust in an awesome God who loves us, who created us. And, and, and we ought to talk about that kind of thing more. So here in, in Deuteronomy, he says a few things. He says, I want you to remember in, in verse 15. Take therefore good heed to yourselves. For you saw no manner of similitude on the day the Lord spoke to you in Horeb in the midst of the fire. Lest you corrupt yourselves to make you graven images. You, you don't need a picture of God. You don't need a likeness of God that you can touch in order to know that God is God, right? In fact, any of these other things might take your attention away from God. He said, unless you lift up your eyes to heaven, you see the sun, moon, and stars, you begin to worship them. But the Lord, he says, verse 20, has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. And then he goes on. And he said, there's going to come a time you're going to be scattered out. There's going to come a time when you're going to forget about God. You're going to start worshiping other gods. But he said, if then, when things aren't going well for you, if you'll seek the Lord, your God, you'll find him. 
you know, there's been a, a quite a bit of talk over the years about people finding themselves. <laughs> you know, I was uh, I hear people telling this thing. I was trying to find myself. <laughs> I guess they didn't have a mirror. <laughs> Nobody got it. <laughs> you know. We don't have to go looking for God because God is already looking for us. All right? God is right here, wherever we are. When you're in tribulation and things happen to you, if you'll turn to the Lord and be obedient to His voice, God will speak to you. You know, I've, I've done this a number of times, and I'll probably do it again. <laughs> Folks who are so sure that they're right when they're wrong. I challenge them to take the word of God and go to the quietness of their own place, wherever it is that they can pray. And on their knees, ask God to reveal to them the truth. And see what comes out of that. I said, don't take my word for it. Take God's word and be willing to follow God's word, what he reveals to you. And God will reveal to you what is right. I believe that. Do you? Amen. Amen. I believe God is a present God. He's not only everywhere present. He is present right here with you and with me. Okay? goes on and he says, For the Lord is a merciful God. He will not forsake you. I know some people. I was talking to one this week. They think they've done so many things. They knew better. You understand what I'm saying? There's nothing like being finding yourself in the wrong way and needing to change like finding yourself in the wrong way and knowing that you knew better. All right? But this person was all concerned that maybe, maybe God couldn't help them. <laughs> Can you imagine that? A God who is all powerful, a God who is merciful and kind and loving, a God who created, a God who redeemed, that he can't help you? Boy, you just made an awful small God out of God, didn't you? So, I encourage them, saying, hey, God said, can we take him at his word? We ought to. God said, I'll put your sins as far as from the east to the west. I'll remember your sins no more. I'm going to tell you, if God can't remember it, <laughs> you know, I see these people on trial, and they got something going on, and, and, uh, and something to be brought up, some, some detail, and they say, oh, well, I don't remember now that's okay, but you know what's really good? is when the judge says, <laughs> I don't remember any of that. Amen. I don't think that happened. It's not in my memory at all. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. When you're accused, when, when your sin is being brought up for the judge to say, no, no, that's not in my memory. Sorry, we're not going to hold that against him. Huh? That's our God. And then the Moses, he, he starts talking about some things. He says, not only will God not forgive you, but when have you ever heard of a God like our God who spoke to us in person from the mountain? Can you imagine that? I mean, God, the God of gods, the God of the universe spoke to his people personally. Scared them to death. All right? Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire and live? <laughs> you see, because gods are terrible things, right? When you talk about the gods of the pagans, what do they do? Oh, they're gods with terrible punishments. They're, they're gods who have all kinds of things they do in order to get you to do what they want you to, right? 
not our God. He tells us what's wrong with us and then lets us live in spite of it. Oh yeah, our consequence is going to eventually catch up with us. He's a just God. He doesn't, he doesn't ignore the weakness. But he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And says, out of heaven he made you to hear his voice. Why? Why did God do that? So he could shout commandments and tell you, this is what I want you to do. I'm, I'm going to make a, a road for you to walk in and you better stick with it. Or else... I'm going to read to you from the scripture. It says, He gave you His voice that He might instruct you. And, and He showed you His great fire that you heard His words out of the midst of fire because He loved your fathers. Therefore He chose their seed after them and brought you out of His sight. And by his mighty power out of Egypt. And it goes on and says, verse 39. Know therefore this day and consider in your heart that the Lord, he is, what? God in heaven above. And upon the earth beneath, there is none else. All right? Chapter 5, verse 6. I am the Lord thy God. You, you see how personal that is? I'm not just some God. I'm not just God. I'm your God. And we can follow it down. Yes, God is eternal, immortal, invisible. The only wise God, the scripture tells us. But he is our God. He created us. That he might inhabit our praise that we might serve him God is a personal God think about it when Adam sinned and he goes to hide himself God could have consumed him right there and said well he messed up we'll start over what did God do you can hear it in the garden, the voice of God. Adam, Adam, where are you? God comes looking for the creature, his created. All right? The Apostle Paul says we're trusted with the gospel of the wonderful God. We're trusted with the gospel of the wonderful God. Isn't that amazing? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be what? All in all. God is everything. Whatever we need, whatever we lack, wherever we are, God is everything. Have you ever been in a place where you thought you were alone? And God's word comforted you. Have you ever been in a place where you thought you were all alone and you prayed and God came through? I remember when I was a teenager, I was about 16. Uh, two of my friends decided that I had offended them in talking to some young lady. All right? You, you know how it is. We take ownership, right? She's mine. 
Well, uh, they weren't engaged. They weren't married. And I, and I was just being a friend, you know, just, just talking. I hadn't taken her on a date. That didn't have any untoward attentions toward her. But there's a misunderstanding. So he gets his friend, and they decide that they're going to ambush me. And, and they're going to deal with it. And so <clears throat> we're going for a walk down through the woods. And these two guys, and they're being all friendly. Until all of a sudden, they stepped over into the bushes. And here they come out with these rubber hoses and, and a stick, you know, one of those uh, kind of like a small ball bat stick. And one of them said to the other one, this is a good place. Now, what do you suppose? You want to trade places with me, anybody? Pardon? Somebody said run. <laughs> one of them for sure could outrun me. All right? They were both stronger, bigger than I was. One of them had been in Memphis going to school in a, in a gym learning how to box. All right? They had bragged about their exploits and so forth. So I know where I am and who I'm dealing with, right? But someone said back there, it's a good time to pray. And I did. And I prayed, Lord, give me something to say. And he did. And I remember starting to talk to these two young men. And you know I never got hit once. And we left there with them apologizing to me for what they intended to do and for not trusting me and with a different understanding that, hey, the girl's probably not worth it anyway. <laughs> you know? In other words, if I can't trust her, what am I doing with her? Right? Where did that come from? You know, God through his spirit steps in. And he worked through me and worked in them. Because by the way, guess what? We were all supposed to be Christian young men going to a Christian academy. Where does that evil come from? From Satan. By the way, lest you forget at any moment any unguarded moment, you can be on the other side. And I dare you to, in your conscience, let the Lord speak. And you'll find out that sometimes you are. That, that just like Peter, when Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. In a moment of weakness, a moment unguarded, we can turn and be on the other side. An enemy of God rather than a friend of God. We need to stay tuned all the time. We're trusted, the apostle says, with the gospel, the wonderful gospel of God. God has such a great desire for us that he wants it to be well with us. We find it several times there in the scripture. He gave us all of his instruction that it might be well with us. How long you think? Always. And, and Revelation, I'm going to close with a couple of verses from Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. Well, let, me, let me follow, follow on this one as we go by. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure there were, are and were created. God created us 
for his pleasure, to worship him, to spend time with him. And God wants so much to spend time with us that the book of Revelation tells us that he's going to put his very throne right here with us. Chapter 21, verse 3, and says, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Amen. And that's not a fearful thing. That's an awesomely wonderful thing that God wants to experience with us, that he wants us to experience with him. And it goes on and says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, verse 14 of, of chapter 22. They might have right to the tree of life and enter the gates through the city. And I'll back up to verse 3 of that chapter and says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve him. And we'll do it with joy and gratitude because he is our God. And we are undeserving creatures that he has granted favor and honor and purpose and being may God help us to realize that more to live it in our lives before our children before our community and our places of work that God might be glorified through us that people might know who the God is that we serve this is my prayer today our Heavenly Fathers, we leave this place today. May we go with joy, with hope. May we go knowing that you are our God. And may we glorify you. May you be the majesty and the praise and the honor be yours through our lives this week. As we go about our lives in our homes, our work, and our places of, of visit this week. Guide and direct us. Keep us in Jesus' name. Amen.